Well, today we're going to study a passage that you'll find in your Bibles in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. And as you make your way there, this, I'll give you a little heads up. The passage has to do with a wedding, with marriage. And uh, this is kind of close and near and dear to my heart because my son, Lucas, just got married a couple weeks ago. And uh, as I studied for this message, I kind of put myself in this place. And uh, it's an amazing thing when two people uh, join their lives together and they get married uh, under God and they uh, make that commitment for a lifetime to, to live together and to honor the Lord and to have the kind of marriage that, and the family that God would want them to have. Uh, and I know many of us here in this room this morning have made that commitment and we've been through a marriage ceremony. The, the difference though is in Matthew 25, we are talking about a traditional Jewish wedding ceremony, which is very different from the way that we get married today in our culture. Today in our culture, uh, a couple gets together and they date for a while. Uh, and they go out to dinner, and they go here, and they go there, and uh, they they try to get to know each other. And for an indeterminate amount of time, some people date, uh, like some people in Bible college dated for a month, and they got married. I thought that was a little strange. Uh, some people date for years and years and years and years and years. And so there's no predetermined amount of time that you must date in America, in our culture, but you date until you get serious enough to propose, and then you have an engagement uh, situation, and then you absolutely have to nowadays have a videographer and someone to uh, video all of it and to have a photographer there so that when you pop the question, you can have it all staged, and it can be so dramatic, and like in the movie, so that you can plaster it all over social media, and everyone in your friends and your family and your circles can see that you've gotten engaged and how you did it and the mistakes that you made and the things, the blunders that you said while you uh, proposed to your wife, your future wife. And so uh, after the engagement, and if you skate by that and you get through it without any kind of going viral for what you've done, then there is an indeterminate amount of time that you are engaged. Some people are engaged for a week. Some people are engaged for four or five years because they can't set a date, I guess. I don't know why. Uh, some people are engaged for a minimal amount of time, of six months or a year, uh, and there's an a, a indeterminate amount of time that you spend between being engaged and getting married. Then the date comes, and the day comes, and thousands and thousands, unfortunately, of dollars are spent on this one event, and then we uh, are in debt for the rest of our lives most of the time because of the, the marriage and the ceremony. I hope not. And then they uh, go on a honeymoon, and honeymoons are very different. People back in the 50s and 60s went to Dairy Queen. Now people go to uh, Bali, and they go to this place, and they go to Europe, and they go to uh, this place, and they go to Africa on safari, and they do all these crazy things. And then again, uh, I believe they're probably in debt for the rest of their life because of the honeymoon. If the wedding didn't get them, the honeymoon surely did. And then they go off and ride off into the sunset, and they live a wonderful, happy life. Yeah, okay. Anyway, that's the way you get married now in our culture. In the Jewish tradition, in the Bible times, in the times of Jesus, the tradition had been that way for a thousand years. They had done it a certain way. And I want to show you the way that they got married and the way that the ceremonies happened and the things that happened in, in the lead up to it so that you can understand our text in Matthew chapter 25. You see, the Jewish marriage tradition, step one, the father of the bridegroom is the word the New Testament uses. That just means the groom, the guy that's going to get married to the girl is the bridegroom in the Bible times, in that, in that language, okay? So... The father of the bridegroom, or what we would call the groom, goes out and picks a girl for his son to marry. Yeah. That's not the way we do it now. Now, listen. 
We find this playing out in Genesis chapter 24 when Abraham, the father of the groom, Isaac, goes out and sends his servants out to pick Rebekah for to be his wife. And there is a, a beautiful romantic story there that's actually involved in that passage of Scripture. And the bride had to say yes. They weren't forcing anybody to get married to some guy like you see on some movies where some old guy forces some other girl or whatever to marry him. That's not the way it worked. The parents got together, and they decided that this was God's will for their children, and the bride had to say yes, just like Rebecca. That was the whole, the whole drama there was would she say yes, and would she agree to going back with the servant to marry Isaac? And so step one was the father going to choose a bride for his son. Step two was the exchanging of gifts in order to legalize the engagement or the betrothal, betrothal uh, the way they said it in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament time. So the engagement wasn't just given a ring or something like that. The father and the family of the groom had to give the the, the bride's family and her a gift and depending on how wealthy they were the gifts were lavish the dowry was uh, enormous there were uh, big gifts there were little gifts and then poor people were able to barely give anything maybe a meal or food but there was something given in exchange to legalize and to bind the engagement now Joseph and Mary were legally bound in their betrothal their engagement and that's why Joseph was trying to figure out how to divorce Mary and so when these gifts are exchanged, it is legally binding in the Jewish tradition that you are engaged, and it's just as if you were married. Step three, the groom has to go and prepare a house for the bride. None of this, we'll figure it out when we get married stuff. None of this, okay, we'll sign up for an apartment sometime when we get ready to go, or hopefully the parents will let us stay at their house kind of stuff. That did not happen in the Jewish tradition. The groom had to go ahead of time and during the engagement period, and he had to prepare a house for the bride to live in, and it had to be all done, had to be ready. When the house is ready, the father declares that the son's house is ready for his bride, and then the wedding ceremony, as we consider it, can begin. So step four is the wedding ceremony itself, and there's a whole lot that goes into that we won't get into this morning. And then the celebration of the wedding lasts for seven days. Now you talk about the wedding reception for Lucas and Sarah uh, was right after the wedding, and we went to a nice place, and they decorated it really well, and it was a beautiful reception, and they had awesome food there, and I was really proud of my extended family now that we've joined, uh, and I would just, I thought they did a great job, but listen, it, it lasted for three or four hours. The Jewish tradition is that the celebration and the supper and all the celebration and festivities lasted for seven days. Now, you talk about a big bill. Just imagine if you had to rent out the country club or the hotel and the venue and have the dinner and the breakfast and the lunch and the banquet dinner for seven days. Oh, preacher, why are you telling us all this? I want you to see why and how this is such a beautiful picture. Marriage in the Jewish tradition is such an awesome picture of Jesus spiritually being the groom of the church and the church being his bride. Now let's go back through the steps and put the scriptures and the spiritual application to Jesus Christ being our groom and us being the bride, the church of God, the real church of the Lord, those that are really saved, those that have really accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior are part of the real church. And the real church is the bride of Christ. Look in Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible is replete with uh, occasions where it talks about and mentions the fact that Jesus uh, has taken us as his bride. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, we won't look at the whole text this morning, but you know the passage of Scripture if you've ever been to a marriage retreat, for sure. Ephesians 5, 23 says this, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church 
and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of, the word, of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, if we go to the very end of the Bible and go to the book of Revelations, the last chapter talks about the fact that Jesus has crowned, he has had the marriage ceremony, and he has uh, adorned his bride, the church. He has brought us into glory to meet with him. We've had the marriage supper. All those things have taken place, and now we are forever the bride of Christ as the church. It, this symbolism is all through the New Testament. So what am I saying? I'm saying spiritually speaking, symbolically, Jesus is the groom in this spiritual marriage, and the bride of Jesus is the church. So let's go back through the Jewish tradition and look at this symbolism that is portrayed here in a Jewish marriage. In step one, the father of the bride, or the father of the groom, chooses the bride for his son. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father chose us to be the church of God if we would be saved in a biblical fashion. And every single one of you, before the foundation of time and before the creation of the world, God knew that you would accept his son as your personal savior and that you would be part of the church of God, which is the bride of Christ. So step one is done. Step two was the exchanging of gifts to legalize the engagement or betrothal. For God so loved his, the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Look in your Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, for you, as much as you know, that ye were not redeemed or saved with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now, why don't, wait a minute. Now, in the Jewish tradition, if you were going to get engaged to a girl, you had to have your family, the father of your family, your father had to give a dowry, had to give expensive gifts to know and to legalize this engagement. When our Heavenly Father wanted to legalize our engagement with the Lord Jesus Christ as our groom and us, the church, as his bride, God the Father gave his son to die in our place for, in order to legalize the spiritual engagement that we have with Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, we weren't bought. Our dowry that God the Father gave for us to be married to Jesus is not some perilous thing. It's not some corruptible thing. It's not a piano. It's not a house. It's not a car. But watch what it is. But with the precious blood of Christ... As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God the Father sent his only son, his begotten, his beloved son, to die on the cross and shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. That's the dowry that God the Father paid for you to be the bride of Christ. It's the biggest dowry that's ever been given. In the history of Jewish marriage, it's the, it's the highest price that anyone's ever paid to be engaged. There was the exchanging like we do of rings at times, depending on the wealth of the family, for the engagement. There was the exchanging of flowers. There's sometimes the exchanging of meals. There was different heirlooms given. It just depends on how wealthy the family was of the, of the groom as to what kind of gifts were exchanged and what kind of rings or what kind of symbols of the engagement might have been given. God the Father, in order to seal the engagement that we have with Jesus Christ as our groom and us as his bride, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit of God. Look in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. 
in Ephesians 1, verse 13. Well, I, let's throw in there verse 12. I like that too. Ephesians 1, 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, or the down payment, or the sealing of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You've got a wedding ring in your heart, in your soul this morning, that is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. That's what God the Father gave as a dowry for you. It just keeps getting gooder and gooder. Step three in the Jewish tradition was that the groom would go and prepare a house for the bride. Look over there in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. The Bible says in verse 1, Jesus speaking, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, as soon as we got engaged to Jesus Christ as the church of God, as soon as you accepted Christ as your personal Savior, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit came in to seal this situation and to give you the dowry. The precious blood of Jesus Christ was shed on the cross for you so that you could be saved and become part of the bride of Christ, which is the church. And now we're awaiting that marriage ceremony and the marriage celebration. And what Jesus has done is just like every Jewish boy would do if he was going to get engaged, he goes to prepare a place for us he's going to prepare a place for us in heaven there's mansions there and he's preparing the place that we're going to spend eternity with our spiritual groom hallelujah and i've been debating for two days now about this situation that i have right now this dilemma that i have in my mind I still don't know exactly what I'm going to do. But part of step three, <laughs> part of step three is that the father, when the house is ready, declares to the son, it's time to go get your bride. And my dilemma was whether to sing this song that the writer wrote because of this in Matthew chapter 25, or to just say the song. I'm just going to say the song. The words to the old gospel hymn go like this, the second verse. I look around me, I see the prophecies fulfilling. And signs of the times, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father. As he says, son, go get your children. At the midnight cry, the bride of Christ will rise. When Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air, and then those that remain shall be quickly changed. At the midnight cry, when Jesus comes again. When heaven is ready, in that very second, that our place that Jesus is preparing for us is ready, God the Father is going to look over to his son and say, Son, it's time. Go get your bride. And all of the church in the moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed into our glorified body. And those that are dead are going to rise up from the grave. And the rapture, what we call the rapture, the catching away of God's bride, is going to happen in that very moment. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, the Bible says. The celebration for a Jewish wedding lasts for seven days. Now, this is for you Bible scholars right here. Okay? So if you don't consider yourself an extreme Bible scholar, just you can tune me out. Look at your phone for a couple minutes. Never gave you permission to do that before, but I am now. 
for those of you that are real Bible scholars, you know that we're going to have a marriage ceremony and a marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelations 19. How long, church, did the marriage ceremony last in the Jewish tradition? Seven days. The book of Daniel in chapter 9 talks about 70 weeks of prophecy until all be fulfilled. The 70 weeks are taken in increments, and we have 69 weeks, and then the 70th week, we believe, is the tribulation period. Seven days represented in seven years. You know where I'm going? That tells me that if we continue on with the Jewish tradition as we have been for the spiritual symbolism of the marriage between us, the church, and Jesus Christ, we're going to be celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be celebrating our marriage to Jesus Christ for the whole seven years of the tribulation period. All right, now, y'all that are not considering yourselves Bible scholars, come back. Come back to me. That's the introduction. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 25 and see what this parable can tell us now that we understand Jewish traditional marriage. Matthew chapter 25. Then, verse 1, shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, the bridegroom is the groom. That's the New Testament word for groom. So there are ten virgins here that represent the entire church. The church is the bride of Christ. This is kind of like a synopsis. It's like a, 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 a kind of a statistical situation here of all representing all the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those that have been saved that are part of the real church of God, they're, they're divided up into ten virgins. They're divided up into two groups, five virgins that were wise, five that were foolish. So the virgins represent the entirety of the church, the real church of God. The lamps, you have to do a lot of study because if you get yourself into a pickle, you can paint yourself into a corner here. The lamps are, I believe, first of all, if you do reference with the Word of God, in order to understand this parable or this illustrative story that Jesus is telling us, the lamps have to be the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Word of God, the Bible, is part of this idea of the lamps that the virgins or the church is carrying. Also, the Bible tells us in Matthew 5, 16, let your light, talking to the church, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I believe that the lamps that they're carrying, the, the ten virgins representing the church of God, they are carrying these lamps that is the word of God, and it is a Christian lifestyle. It's their good works. It's the way that they come to church. It's the way that they dress. It's the way that they talk. It's the way that they pray. It's the way that they study their Bible. It is the way that they comport themselves. Their lifestyle is this lamp. If you understand the lamps back in these days when Jesus is giving us this parable or this illustrative story, they were a little receptacle, sometimes made out of clay, and then there was a little stick that the candle was on. Sometimes it had a covering, sometimes it didn't. They put it up on a stick so it could be like a torch. Inside that little receptacle was oil in order to wet the wick, in order to produce fire. Inside the, meat, the same lamp or torch was the receptacle that held the oil. And of course, we understand in the parable that the bridegroom is Jesus. So we have the symbolism defined here. Now let's walk through the story, understanding traditional Jewish marriage. The Bible says that five of the virgins, or those of the, 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 the bride, five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, I don't think it's a difficult stretch. As a matter of fact, there's a lots of times in the New Testament and the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit is described or symbolically represented by oil. Many, many times talks about the anointing even of Jesus for the ministry, which means that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. The, the oil many times in the New Testament represents the Holy Spirit. So there are a half 
representatively speaking, there is half of the church of God that has the lamp, they've got the Bible, they got the Word of God, they got their conversation, their lifestyle, they've got all their mannerisms, they go to church, but they have no oil. They got the lamp, but they got no oil. What is the oil, church? The Holy Spirit. So they're running around pretending to be Christians, pretending to live a Christian lifestyle, pretending to do everything God wants them to do, but there's no Holy Spirit inside of them. They're not really a born-again Christian. They're not really part of a church. As we continue on in Matthew chapter 25 to see this story, this parable, this illustrative story played out in our Bibles, they that were foolish took their lambs, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels. Now, the vessels is talking about, of course, their body, but also talking, spiritually speaking, it's their body, but also in the lamb situation, it's that receptacle, that clay pot, that little clay uh, saucer, if you will, that was part of the bottom of the lamp. Inside that, the wise bride of Christ or virgins, they had oil in their lamp. They had the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now watch this. The wise, the real church of God that had the Holy Spirit, and the unwise, the foolish, that didn't have the Holy Spirit, that are faking, that are fake Christians, they're not really saved. Both of them, the bridegroom, Jesus, the groom of, of the church, he tarried so long that they all slumbered and slept. The Bible says that there's going to be a great falling away before the Lord comes back. And I think we're seeing it in America. Well, i got a lot of churches that I know of that are slumbering and sleeping. Now watch that. That's a very, very de detailed way of saying that. Slumber means that you get drowsy. One of the ways that I always entertain myself after I finally figured it out, the first freshman year of Bible college, I had a hard time. I had 7.30 classes every day, had these professors that were so monotone and so boring, and they never told stories, and they just did all the theology, and I just was, I was going to sleep every, every morning. I finally found a trick my second year is watch everybody else try not to go to sleep, and that entertained me long enough to stay awake because I would sit in the back of the class because my name is Webster, that's where I belong, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, though, one day. So I'm in the back of the class, and I'm watching everybody else. You know, some people just bang their head really hard. It was super entertaining. That's slumber. Would you not say that in many parts, at least of America, the church of God, real and fake, is slumbering? They're getting drowsy. The bride, the groom hasn't come back in so long. It's been almost 2,000 years. And the church is getting slumbering. They're slumbering. They're getting tired. They're getting weary. We're nodding off. We're not paying attention to the priorities of reaching the lost. And then after you slumber for a little while, you're going to just go to sleep. And that's what the church is doing. The church is about everything but what it ought to be about. But notice what it says. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, that's where this song came from. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That's talking about the rapture. The church of God, represented by these ten virgins, five foolish, five wise, is representative of the church, the bride of Christ. And one day at midnight, at the latest hour, the time that people are the sleepiest and want to be asleep, at the very hour when you just don't suspect it, at the hour when you don't think he's going to come, Jesus is going to come back for his bride. And all of us that are the true church of God are going to go up, up, not out to meet him. Hmm. But there's a problem. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. You see, the people, some of the people that were in the foolish camp, they got up and trimmed their lamps as well. They thought they were going. They thought they were part of the bridal party. 
You ever seen that aunt or that uncle or whoever it is that wants to be part of the bridal party and they're not? That's the way these people are. At midnight, the cry was made, Behold, the bride and groom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. What is the lamp? The lamp is the Bible and your Christian lifestyle. You can't live a real Christian lifestyle in front of Jesus Christ without the oil. When you're old, when you don't have any oil in your lamp, you're just pretending. You're just doing it for the, for the benefit of everybody else to make yourself look good. But when the, when the bridegroom comes back, it's going to be judgment day. And those that have been faking in church and those that have been acting like they're saved and those that have been trying in their own flesh and their own strength to live the Christian life, they're going to go out to meet him and realize, I don't have the oil. And it's going to be a bad day for them. The Bible says a very sad, some very sad commentary about the foolish part of the church that was faking. The foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Here's what you want to see from that. I can't get saved for you, and you can't get saved for me. It's a personal decision that you have to make. You can't share the oil. If I could share the oil, I'd just go down through all the internet and I'd just pray everybody saved all across the face there. I'd incorporate all of y'all and a bunch of other churches. We'd just sit down and pray everybody saved all across the world. But you can't get saved for anybody else. You can only make the decision to accept Christ as your personal Savior yourself. It's a personal decision to have a personal Savior. So the wise part of the church said to the foolish part of the church, we can't share our oil with you. you got to go to the benders and buy it. Now, every parable breaks down in its symbolism in some place, and you can't go buy the Holy Spirit, and you can't buy your salvation. It's not what they're saying. They're just saying we can't share it, so you're going to have to figure it out on your own. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. When that trumpet sounds, the door to salvation is shut for you. There's no second chances, no coming back and around, no changing your mind, no deciding to repent at the last hour. Let me tell you, when you take your last breath and or when that trumpet sounds, that's it. The door to salvation will be shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, those foolish part of the church, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. In another part of Matthew, he said they, they're going to cry out, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not preached and done miracles in your name? We've been a part of the church. No, you wasn't. You were living a fake life. You were pretending to have oil in your lamp, and you had none. Jesus, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, here's the whole moral of the story. Here's the whole lesson of this parable. The whole lesson of all the introduction and everything that I've said today. Verse 13. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let me tell you, church, in a group this size, there's almost no possibility that there's not one or two or three that are faking being a Christian. Statistically, it's almost impossible that there wouldn't be one or two here this morning that are faking the Christian life. They're saying the right things. They're doing the right things. They come to church. They have a good uh, family history of being in church. They've been a Baptist for a long time. They've been a, a Jesus follower for a long time. They get on social media and, and proclaim about Jesus. They listen to Christian songs. They even read their Bible and they pray. But they don't have the oil. There's no Holy Spirit living inside of them. Let me tell you real quickly how you know. Right now. As we get into this invitation time, and I'm going to ask you if you don't have the oil of the Holy Spirit indwelling in your life, and you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you because you're not a real Christian, and you're faking it, I'm going to ask you to come down here and get saved. And when I do that, if you're a child of God and part of the true church of God, the Holy Spirit's going to go, aren't you glad you did that? 
Aren't you glad that you're saved and part of the bride of Christ? Aren't you glad that you're on your way to heaven and the Holy Spirit is going to confirm with your spirit that you are a child of God? But if that Holy Spirit, when we have this invitation in just a moment, says to you, you better get down there to that altar because you don't know how much longer you're going to live and you don't know when the Lord's coming back. I'm telling you right now, come and let us show you from the word of God how you can be saved for real so that you can be part of the bride of Christ and you can meet Jesus in the air and you can celebrate our marriage, spiritual marriage with the Lord Jesus Christ for the whole seven years of the tribulation period and then through all eternity, we can have a loving relationship with our groom, with our master, with our Lord because we are the church of Christ.